right, thank you all very much for staying with us for this next panel. Um, we are taking a look at capitalism in a post-COVID world. Uh, we just heard Roger Cohen, my colleague, in conversation with Anand Jiri Harardas, and one of the main uh, takeaways from that discussion um, is the idea that companies uh, and governments during, amid this COVID crisis are increasing their choke, chokehold on power in a variety of ways. Um, the COVID crisis obviously has uh, shaken up how we view the world uh, and how the world works. In particular, uh, this crisis appears to be serving as a wake-up call for reforming capitalism in the different forms that it takes around the world. Shareholders are pressing businesses to take more responsibility as concerns about inequality, climate change, and populism grow. And at the same time, governments in the United States, Europe, China, and elsewhere are uh, stepping forward with massive uh, financial support for their economies, but raising at the same time uh, questions about cost and competitiveness trade-offs, and of course, this issue of uh, a, a growing chokehold on power. Uh, I'm Liz Alderman, I'm the chief uh, European business correspondent for the New York Times, and I'm really happy to be welcoming a distinguished panel today uh, to uh, discuss uh, these issues that are confronting us. Uh, Beata Yavorsik, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. You're the chief economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Thanks for, for joining us virtually. Uh, we've got Eric Lee as well uh, joining us uh, from uh, China. You're a venture capitalist and a political scientist uh, uh, based in Shanghai. Valerie Keller, uh, we're happy to have you here in person. Uh, you're the co-founder and CEO of Imagine. Uh, and Frederica Perucci, uh, you are currently an author, a former, an author, a former senior executive at the French company Alstom, and uh, currently a founding partner at uh, Icarian. Um, let me start with, uh, I want to ask all of you sort of this question, if I may, this opening question, uh, and that is, you know, will the coronavirus pandemic change capitalism as we know it? And to the extent that it's happening, you know, how, how big of a change are we, are we seeing? Beata, maybe I could toss that question to you to respond to first. It's a pleasure to be part of this conversation. So I think that the pandemic will leave the world with a much greater public support for state ownership in the economy. Now, this is not a new trend. Public support for state ownership has been growing steadily over the last two decades. And that's a reflection of dissatisfaction with increasing inequality and dissatisfaction with the shifting of risk away from business onto the workers who are least able to bear those risks. So workers with little education, workers who get low incomes. And if you look at surveys, a third of respondents in advanced countries support expansion of public ownership. And that's an increase of six percentage points over 20 years. Now in post-communist countries, this figure is even larger. It's 45% of people who want to see expansion of public ownership. And that support is greater among lower income people, among women, among those currently employed in the public sector. Now, what the past pandemic uh, teach us, or past recessions, is that people who came into adulthood during a recession uh, are much more supportive of public ownership. People who have come into adulthood during recession, during epidemics also view public ownership more positively. So, and these numbers, these changes um, in, the, in people's preferences may be enough in some countries to actually sway the majority view. So what I would expect is that we are more likely to see state as part of the solution rather than a problem in the post-pandemic world. Thank you. Uh, Eric, from where you're sitting in China, is that um, how, ha how, would you, how would you describe the, how the situation has, has panned out there? Obviously, the pandemic uh, started there, uh, but yet China uh, took swift action, and now the Chinese economy is, is rebounding. The state obviously played a, a major role in that. Describe to us, if you would, sort of that, that interaction. How, how is that changing capitalism, Chinese capitalism as we know it? 
Well, thank you. Um, first of all, let me uh, say that I'm happy to report that uh, things are going great here. Uh, we've been actually we've been back to normal for a long time uh, since April and May. Uh, although, albeit Q2 was somewhat slower uh, than before, but uh, when we began uh, the summer, um, everything was going on full steam. Uh, you know, I'm a venture capitalist. I've got a lot of companies. Uh, virtually all of them have been going on full cylinders, all cylinders. Uh, so I've been busier than ever, traveling everywhere in the country. It's a big country. Um, so I, I haven't been able to fly internationally, but but it feels like I've been flying just as many kilometers domestically <laughs> in the last few months. I've been uh, flying internationally. Um, so so business is going great. Um, it's we pretty much eliminated, uh, I believe, the pandemic. Uh, so uh, that's that's the good news. Uh, but to answer your question, obviously, I don't live in a capitalist society. I live in a socialist country. Um, so perhaps. Um, let me address the question as capitalism in the capitalist world, <laughs> if you will. Um, you know, capitalism is a loaded word, of course. Nobody knows what it means. Um, but uh, the short answer is to the question whether the pandemic is changing capitalism as we know it. My answer is it should, but it probably won't. Um, because capitalism in the capitalist societies around the world has um, gotten into a state where you know, I would call it political capitalism, or some people call it neoliberalism, uh, which really means that capital or special interests uh, that represent capital have captured the political system uh, for their own good. Uh, and it's, it's being ossified um, without drastic political reform. Um, I don't think you can ch change capitalism for the better uh, to solve problems like the pandemic. Um, and the pandemic uh, really has what, what's re what has revealed is this great dysfunction in governance in many capitalist societies or, or, or liberal societies, if you will. Um, and and we've, we're seeing a, a, a total degradation of governance, of state capacity uh, to solve problems for the collective. Uh, um, and, and, I, and I think it's a political problem, not an economic problem. Uh, so it's, it'll be very, very difficult to, uh, to, 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 to solve. To, to solve. Let me, uh, let me turn, if I could, to our panelists who are actually physically here in the room with us. If, if I could turn to Frederic, uh, just uh, you know, a response to what Eric is saying. Uh, you were a former executive at, at Alstom. Uh, you actually recently came out uh, with a book about a very unusual experience that you had uh, in the United in the United States uh, when you were <laughs> arrested uh, uh, for uh, what you described as uh, basically uh, the uh, 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 actions that the United States uh, were was was taking to uh, to try and uh, uh, to use law as an economic we weapon. Um, anyway, the issue that, that Eric just raised um, is one that you yourself um, are, are dealing with. Tell us what your response is to that. Yes, thank you, first of all, for uh, inviting me. Um, I, I think the issue with the COVID is that it comes as a situation at a point in time where it, uh, we had already a big crisis before, a big economic war between, between China and the US. So it comes at a time uh, where it's a perfect storm where basically we are going through a global leadership change in the, in the world. And the, uh, COVID is just going to exacerbate what has been already planted uh, before. And I think for capitalism to work, like for our democracy to work, you need, uh, you need three things. You need rules that everybody understands and obey. You need trust in those rules. And then you need to uh, provide people with uh, the hope that tomorrow is going to be better with this system and with uh, any, of any other systems. And in the past few years, I mean, each of those uh, points have been, uh, um, have been changing. Uh, first of all, the rules are no longer obeyed by everybody. Everybody is trying to change the rules. Uh, we went from uh, the post-World World War II system uh, with uh, the uh, World Bank Organization, with the uh, nation, nation, uh, United Nations, with the World Trade Organization, and so on. And as we see it, you know, uh, people try to change the rules and move from multilateralism to unilateralism. 
And that's going to be exacerbated by the COVID, obviously, because you know, everybody is going to change the basic rules. And then people have lost trust as well in, the, in those rules, because those rules have been also um, uh, changed you know, when we saw some issues with IPRs, when we saw issues with data protection, when we saw issues with use of the law as an economic weapon to destabilize uh, uh, countries or companies. So those basics, fundamentals have been, have been changed. So therefore, we have lost the, the, we have lost the people in, in all this. We've lost uh, the trust of the people. And this has been also exacerbated by the fact that the people who thought they were living in a, for instance, in a democratic uh, uh, environment, you know, uh, realized that the state could no longer uh, provide them with basic safety, so health safety, but uh, and economic uh, safety and so on. So unfortunately, I think we're going to, to go into a world much more chaotic, uh, but not because of the COVID. COVID is just going to accelerate what's been in, planted for some time. Valerie, I see, you, I see you nodding your head at that statement. I mean, at imagine uh, uh, your, your group, you work obviously sort of with uh, CEOs uh, who are uh, trying to re respond uh, in a better way, I guess, to, to uh, increased uh, pressure that stakeholders are bringing, uh, you know, for companies to act in a more responsible way. Um, tell us about, you know, this issue of trust that, that is being brought up in this discussion, um, you know, how, how can companies, especially at a time like this, um, get the trust of more people, also in an economic environment uh, where, uh, despite uh, noble pledges that are being made, the economic reality is going to be very harsh. We're going to see rising unemployment, uh, more social distress. Talk to us about those challenges and yeah. how you're navigating them. Yeah, happy to. So if I also go back, Liz, to your question of saying, uh, will COVID change capitalism? Mm -hmm. I would suggest to us that the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And by that, I mean it already has changed it. Uh, so if you look at essentially um, this fact that we are globally interconnected, we have realized that we can respond quickly to global challenges if and when we need to, but I think we've also realized that there's nobody driving Spaceship Earth, as Planet uh, Book Mr. Fuller said as well. And so I think what we see is a realization that there is a concentration of political and economic power, and there is a question that says, okay, but is that working for all of us? And then how do we as individual leaders or people who are in positions of power operate within that reality? So if I give an example by that, I mean that even just looking at the New York Times, was it two weeks ago? The special edition that you did on essentially the, com the um, commentary on the Milton Friedman essay. 50 years on. And essentially that was a bit of a mea culpa that says actually that didn't, that didn't work. It didn't work for in terms of really making sure that we had um, people who could find safe livelihoods and also within our planetary boundaries. And so if you look at then saying that was a seminal shift, I believe, that is ushering in a clarity that says there's an awareness that capitalism as we knew it, this Friedman ideology hasn't provided for freedom for human beings. We're here talking about democracy and the ability to live a great life as humans and find meaningful work and be connected. So what I see and we have seen is there is an awareness and an agreement that it hasn't worked. That's the starting point for understanding that it's different. I think of another seminal moment and uh, the CEO of Walmart, one of the world's largest companies in the world, global. So standing there saying to the leadership of the world who was listening onto this on their ship that says, actually the freedom and ideology and capitalism hasn't fully served us well and that Walmart is shifting to a regenerative company. That is a mindset shift that will change how it does business and what it does business with. So where we come from this is saying, look, you can sit there and do what Anand often does, which is push on businesses as being bad and evil. Human beings are the system. We make up, we talk about we want systems change, systems change. It's some people who are in current positions of power. And the thing that I and we are seeing and imagine is that these CEOs are human beings who also see what time it is, who also understand that we were on a trajectory to four degrees, who see what's happening in terms of our biodiversity loss, that our species has been fundamentally killing off other species or somehow not solving and caring for that, and who understand that the world doesn't work if people aren't employed, don't have living wages, and don't feel safe and protected. So what we see is CEOs who are coming together as human beings who say, I care, and this is not okay, and not on my watch. And it's not everybody, but it's enough. And I think what we see is that when you act together across a value chain, as we're seeing CEOs coming together in food, 
We've seen it now in fashion. We're starting to see it in finance and in other sectors that says if I'm a CEO and I think that, okay, I can only do so much within my company's space, but if I pull together across a value chain, we can actually transform markets. We can lift the floor for others if and when we work with the regulators and the governments. So that's where you have human beings who are in positions of business leadership who show up and saying, okay, we need to do business in a different way that is long-term, multi-stakeholder, everything the New York Times was talking about, right? So, social responsibility, yeah? And, but we can't do that by ourselves, and we have to work with the human beings who are in positions of power in the regulatory environment. So when we have CEOs coming together say, how can we help the EU Green Deal not become a brown deal? That is, how do we work with the regulators to say, how do we create the right incentives for us to be able to do what we know we need to do to help transform, if that case, food and agriculture, in other cases, fashion? So I think it's already happening, and I think the other thing that isn't a done deal, and this is the part that really worries me, is you know what Eric was saying here in China, it's back to normal. And, and I remember a CEO, and I shared this story with you before as well, a CEO, a woman who was in China, um, and she told me, she said, you know, Valerie, I am the future because what's happening here is just as Eric said, you know, there's hope for you guys. It can be normalized as well with where you are. She said, I, um, I'm like anybody else. I understand that there's no planet B. I know that business has a social and environmental responsibility. I see the data that says ESG companies have actually outperformed by 66% others in this environmental crisis. She said, but if to be honest with you, when I see the smog coming back over Shanghai, I'm encouraged because I feel like we're back on track. And this notion that says, well, wait a minute, we can't have healthy, unhealthy pe healthy people on an unhealthy planet, and this isn't going to be a, a trade-off between can we provide for jobs and livelihood, and can we actually take care of the environment and do the changes that we know we need to do. So I think that the shift has happened in terms of an awareness that the current system as it's been hasn't provided for all of us and our host environment. But I also think that the, uh, the potential to potentially stay in this seeming paradox of, well, but the business of business needs to just provide for jobs and livelihood, and humans have to then be in that planet, isn't going to sustain us. And is, so I would say that we're in a fragile moment, um, but I do believe that enough humans are waking up, and if you talk about the younger generation, they're already there. So early humans who are coming into this are saying, sorry, that doesn't work for us. And I think that's the other thing that was going to already, if you looked at the kind of video that was shown before this panel, those two women, they've got it. They are it. They're talking about the relationship between business and government and people and society, and they're just saying it doesn't work if it doesn't work for all of us. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the big challenge going forward, though, is that uh, those, are, those are important pledges that companies are making, but we're also in a global economic environment in which we're uh, facing a huge challenge, and that is um, a, a, signif a significant decline in, in demand, um, a huge change in uh, our social behavior that is going to shift entire industries and that won't necessarily allow companies that are making those kind of pledges to be able to stick to them. Uh, Beata, I wanted to uh, come back to you um, uh, on the role of governments because we're, we're seeing governments basically having to step in in a huge way during this crisis to support societies, to also support uh, businesses, um, coming forward with a huge amount of spending, um, and being present, having big government present in a way that um, has been almost unprecedented um, for, for a number of decades. Um, can you talk to us about, you know, how long, how long would you expect that, that dynamic to last? And also, you know, <laughs> How, how we're also in uh, a number of uh, a analyses out there say that we're also creating basically zombie companies uh, with all of this support. So can you talk to us about basically how you see that unfolding? An excellent question, Liz. Um, so as you have said, we've seen governments protecting jobs. And it's a good idea to protect jobs for three months but protecting jobs for three years is not sustainable. Um, so what we need to do is to focus on protecting workers, not protecting jobs. We don't want to freeze the economy as it was in February because the world has changed. We have changed the way we consume um, services. We've changed the way we consumed entertainment. We've changed the way we shop. 
So what we need to do is allow restructuring of economy taking place. And in particular, restructuring with an eye on green transformation. At the EBRD, we've just run a survey with the German IFO Institute, and we found that as a result of the pandemic, many people have increased their awareness of climate change problems. And the numbers reported in the survey are mind blowing. 50% of people in Turkey said now climate change is a big deal for them personally as a result of seeing the pandemic. It's more than 40% of people in Egypt or Greece and 20% of people in Belarus. Um, so this crisis is also an opportunity to do something on climate change. And as Valerie said, there has been a shift in awareness, but there is a collective action problem, right? You know, dealing with climate change costs money. And during the times of economic hardship, it's not easy for firms to embark on such a transformation. And that's why, uh, you know, I think the key phrase in Valerie's um, uh, message was firms need to work with governments. Firms need to work with governments on the best way of using regulation to stimulate climate change. And, you know, they should do it not because they are nice, but because it's in their interest, because there is a silent backlash building up against capitalism, against private ownership. Um, so, and it's also, it can be in the interest of large firms. When you talk to firms in emerging markets, they often say, well, you know, we are already doing many right things because we are under pressure from our uh, customers in Western countries, in advanced countries. But SMEs, the smaller players are not. So many large firms actually would like regulation to level the playing field again, you know, to have the same rules for themselves and smaller players. So more cooperation on the regulatory front is what I would suggest. Thank you. I suggest. Thank you. Yeah. And Eric, from where from where you sit, how feasible is all of that sound to you? Well, look, um, this morning I was reading Wednesday's New York Times. Um, I get the paper a day late here in Shanghai. Um, and on the front page, there's this big story and, and a very uh, 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 big picture, very uh, sad picture, showing that the uh, fashion industry in capitalist societies have destroyed India's rivers. Okay, and all the communities around those rivers, their lives and livelihoods destroyed uh, because of the fashion industry in capitalist societies. They're so demanding the dyes, you know, moving to river. The rivers that used to be pristine 10, 20 years ago are, not, are now uninhabitable. Uh, and and it, it really, it's, it's a very, very sad story. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I'm very supportive of what Valerie is saying but I just don't think it's gonna work. Um, this corporate social responsibility idea, I mean, we've had that for a long time. I mean, we've been talking about that for 25 years. I mean, I, was, I, mean, I remember back in the days when business school, we were talking about it, you know, 20, 25, 30 years ago. I mean, if it works, it should have worked. Okay, it, it doesn't work. Um, businesses are not built this way. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a, a fan of Milton Friedman, uh, but, but I'm afraid he was right in his technical analysis that companies are built to deliver profits to it, their owners. I mean, unless you're telling me that you're going to appoint people who represent communities' interests or other interests onto the boards of those companies. Uh, I just don't think it's going to work. Uh, it, it hasn't worked for 25 years. I mean, all the arguments I hear today, I used to hear them when I was a very, very young man in business school. <laughs> okay, everything, a repeat. And look at, I mean, tell, tell that to the, to the people who live on those rivers in India. Okay, uh, two generations have passed. Um, so, so I, you know, my answer is, I just don't think the answer is in the hands of CEOs. 
the answers is in the hands of political leaders. But those political leaders in capital societies are in the pockets of special interests. So without drastic political reforms, without drastic institutional reforms, without changing the entire systems, I just don't think uh, you could reform capitalism. Let me, that's a really uh, important point that you're making. I do want to give Valerie in a moment a, a chance to respond, but before I do, Frederic, uh, you know, what, what is your view? I mean, you are somebody who, you know, a former uh, chief executive of one of the world's biggest companies, who yourself have also worked with governments. What is, what is your uh, view of what, of what Eric just said? Uh, I agree with, with Eric that companies are not going to change because they are not built uh, as such. I think only government can impose uh, things to, uh, to companies and people. Uh, and I think, um, I think Valerie, you're right. This is going to be coming from the young generation because those uh, young kids, you know, and this young generation, you know, they are built in a completely different way. Uh, we've seen during the COVID crisis that. Uh, a lot of countries are too dependent on low-cost, uh, just-in-time deliveries of uh, goods. Uh, so there's a big shift now towards reindustrialization of some uh, countries, at least on strategic uh, product. This in itself is going to uh, stop some of the crazy flows between countries that, you know, importing oranges from all over the world you know, to Europe it doesn't make any sense. So, and also some, some of the strategic products. So I think the pressure is going to come more from the street uh, that people will want to be, feel safe at home. They will want to make sure that they have a mask, that they have a hospital warning, that they will want to make sure that they are, keep their job. And in order to keep their job, they will want to make sure that you know, they can manufacture uh, the goods at home and so on. So I think we're going to see this shift, and we already see this, this shift. A lot of countries are saying, okay, I, I don't need so, so many trade uh, agreements with so many, many countries. I can do it on, uh, I, I can do it on my own. This trend, uh, I think, uh, started some time ago, and this is exacerbated again by the economic war, because if you look at the economic war between China and the US with the European in the middle, you see a lot of uh, 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 countries saying, you know, I'm going to put a wall uh, around me, you know, look at the internet, it's going to be probably broken up into two or three uh, internets because nobody wants to, is their data to be shifted right and left, nobody wants to be spied right and left and so on. So we're going to see this move. This move is going to, at the end of the day, have a, it's going to be a new kind of capitalism. It's not going to be a uh, sovereign, it's going to be a new kind of capitalism that we need to, to build. But I think the good thing about this new world is going to be uh, for the environmental, environmental. It's not going to come from the top, it's going to come from the street that you know, people will want to buy locally, will want to uh, basically use the local economy and develop their local economy. Mm -hmm. Valerie, over you, and we have a, a question coming in that basically plays off of what the both of you just said. Uh, uh, a, uh, a viewer is asking, can social ills be corrected under a capitalist system that focuses on profit? So, look, I'm not an, I, a naive, I'm a pragmatist, actually. So I don't disagree with what Eric is saying. I mean, you know, 25 years, I've grown up in that, too. I'm 44 years old. That means half my life has been in the kind of, like, oh, we're in this move, too, right? Um, Yes, the rivers have been polluted. There's ore on a trajectory to have more plastic in the oceans than fish. Uh, the Aral Sea, which was the fourth largest sea when I was born into the world in 1976, is now a carcinogenic desert floor bed with camels walking on it. Why? Not because of the, any kind of horrible ill will, but because the water was diverted by the Soviets for cotton production for textile production, for clothing and fashion. So here you have this loss of wages, all the you know, diseases, all of that. It was just unintended. Why? Because people were acting unconsciously. They weren't saying, oh, we had Rana Plaza. That was another failure. Why didn't that wake us up? So when we say, is business now there to clean up the act of the mess that it caused? There is a bit of that that's yes. If I then say, OK, but business isn't going to do it, so therefore we need more political power, who in this conversation really sees the trajectory to be able to change the laws in the time frame that we need to bend the curve. I don't see it. And so because we haven't seen it, we can't rely on the government 
the business community. It's who is in power today. And the fact that we have concentration of hands in the power of big global corporations, there are human beings who are global, who are starting to take responsibility for their supply chain to say, okay, not on my watch. It's not okay that somebody dies in a plaza that, that, or doesn't get a living wage and a child is going hungry on that. It's not okay that the rivers in Indonesia for textile productions are purple. When we have the money, we have the innovation, we have the technology and know-how. So my, and I started in the social sector space. I was running homeless shelters at one point, had the option to go into government and said, okay, but where's the energy of how things can move quickly in this system? And if we've made up, as we're going to hear a bit from, uh, I think Yuval Harari is here, with Sapiens, humans made up this notion of money. It was this thing for trust between us. But if we have made the search for money become the dominant thing that we're all living this life experience for, that's not going to be something that is able to then sustain us as we go. I think there is a consciousness shift and an awareness, and I'm not saying that business is the answer. I'm saying that human beings who say it's not okay that we are actually connected to each other and we are actually connected to our nature uh, and to our natural environment, and it doesn't work the way that it's been working. And because those people are in a position to tomorrow change their business behavior if their mindset shifts, I have hope. Because they are coming together, and this isn't theory, this is practice. This is within three weeks of being able to put out a call, we asked 27 CEOs across the full food value chain, and they showed up as fathers and mothers and as human beings who care. And that is the part that gives me hope. And then when they say, you know what, we do need a new regulatory standard, we're asking the political regulation to help incentivize us to do the things that we know we need to do. If we know we can sequester carbon in the soil, Oil. But how do we help create the enabling environment that does that? And then how can we connect into regulators and provide safe space? I'm not saying it has all the answers, but I will tell you, Liz, and the rest of you, it is the thing that is giving me hope. Because we are seeing also the same thing, a private equity company that is saying, oh, wait, we need to transform capital to be a force for good. This has been unsustainable. My children are all turning vegan and vegetarian on me. Why? not because it's trendy and cool, but because they say they know the impact of animal agriculture on deforestation and on our environment. And so we can't. We need to help transform capital to be a force for good. And what does that mean for us? And so we see leaders waking up. And I'm not saying it is the answer, but I am saying that we can't sit here and admire the problem and say it's up to them. Is it government or is it up to business? We are the ones that we've been waiting for. And if we don't start showing up as human beings who say we need to be working together to say how do we create the environment that provides for long-term, multi-stakeholder, unless we're going to move into the kind of environment that Eric is in and become a socialist economy. But if we're not, then I would suggest to us that we've got to figure out this conscious capitalism, multi-stakeholder, firms that are providing for the well-being and care of others. And I would also suggest to us that the conversations that we are having with business leaders is that people are there. They know this works. That it isn't a normal paradox and trade-off anymore. Then so I'm not saying everybody is. Well, what I am yeah. saying is that enough people have put tipped. it back into. If we could put all of what you're saying in back into the the current context and the even greater challenges that we're facing, though, in a COVID world and a post-COVID world. Um, the the word that was brought up earlier during this conversation, trust. There are still a lot of people out there who don't necessarily trust. Uh, the, the pledges that you're talking about that CEOs are making because they don't see that companies are necessarily putting their money where their mouth is when you have a lot of corporations that are going to, going to be laying off tens of thousands of people uh, during this crisis despite receiving uh, government support. Um, people are concerned about the environment, but they're more concerned about putting food in their mouths and being able to uh, uh, provide for their families without having to live off of government support for uh, the foreseeable future. And we have, you know, another a person who's written in has made a comment, no matter if there is neoliberal capitalism or state capitalism, uh, hedge funds, and just generally speaking, you know, those with power and those with money um, are growing in parallel and, and creating even greater inequalities in our societies and protests are emerging. It's unsustainable. And, yeah. The current trajectory is unsustainable. So let me, if we only have three minutes left, but if I could, I would... Uh, just love for the for all of you to very quickly, if you could, just give a Twitter Twitter response to this question. What and you know, given everything that we're seeing, everything that's been discussed during this panel, what would you say we have learned so far about the trade-off uh, be between uh, you know this this 
dilemma that the world is facing, keeping our economies open to avoid further economic catastrophe, um, and the imperative to protect health. And you know, how are both governments and companies going to deal with this moving forward? <laughs> Frederick. <laughs> Um, I, I think that the big challenge is going to, to uh, come to, uh, to stop the economic war. Again, I'm coming back to this because as long as you have economic war, you know, companies are not going to uh, cut themselves in order to, uh, for the good of the world, you know, if you, are an, if you know that your competitor is not going to do the same thing. Uh -huh. So, and if you're going to talk about ESG norms, okay, maybe, but if people believe, again, I, I come to the same thing, if people believe in the uh, rules that are being laid out, yes. If people believe that nobody's going to uh, cheat, yes. But right now, if you don't have the trust, and right now we are not in the moment where trust is there between big nations. So if you don't have the trust, you need something else to, 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 to make it work. Uh, it's not going to come from the top again. Mm -hmm. I think, because there's no trust at the, at the top. So what could have been a, a good solution is if we make peace right now, stop the economic war, and work together, especially China and US, and of course Europe in the middle, but right now it's not, not going to happen. Yeah. And it's not going to happen for, for many, many reasons. So the only way for me this is going to, to, uh, going to change the paradigm is if people are really imposing this on everybody. On, on, on everybody. People demand supply, short supply chain. People demand uh, local product manufactured in a uh, socially environmentally uh, uh, nice way, and so on. This is going to make uh, change uh, the world. I think coming from the top right now, I don't. I'm not very optimistic uh, on, on that on that stage. Great, very good. Well, I wish we actually had more time to talk about this. I was hoping that all of you could answer the question, but you know, thank you very much for joining us, and this is clearly a discussion that needs to continue in the future. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. We really appreciate it, and uh, please stick around for the next panel.